subscribers, we are back and we are happy to have you here. We are actually live and we are alive today. There is so much to be grateful. Let's make today count. We are so excited. We are showcasing three big stories today. But first, I wanted to share some really great feedback about the show that I just received yesterday from an earlier guest, Heidi Perro. If you did not catch her story, please look for it on our YouTube channel or on Apple or any streaming, any of your favorite streaming platforms. She has a phenomenal story that she opened up about rectal cancer and her journey as a young woman uh, with a stoma. And so this was just the feedback that I received yesterday and I was so excited, I wanted to share it with you. So this is from Heidi herself, here goes. Uh, I just wanted to take a minute and thank you for helping me to get my story out there. My goal in telling you my journey was to start a conversation. And wow, what a conversation we have started. Since the podcast aired, I have had so many people reach out, some wanting to offer their prayers, some telling me about their own, own journeys. Some had follow-up questions about their stomas and rectal cancers but most just wanted to thank me for being brave enough to share my story. They wanted to let me know that they now feel empowered to share their own stories. This is exactly what I was hoping for. So thank you very much for what you do. Please continue bringing the hard topics to light and I will continue to watch so that I may continue to grow and learn. Triple hearts, even with that. And this heartfelt note just completely made my day because this is the exact reason that I am here doing this podcast and propelling this message of hope and inspiration to help people stay the course through adversity and to even thrive alive through adversity and to find the tools to do so, to really open up that conversation about hardship. So this was a really, um, really, really impactful note that I received. So I'm really thankful to Heidi for that. Um, I also hope you found amazing inspiration from our last show with Chris Revel that we focused on PTSD. What an amazing show that was. And in the next two recordings today, gosh, we are, have an amazing show ahead. We're featuring Dr. Gabor Mate, And then we have um, up at two o'clock, we have Carter Perry, uh, a Hawaiian, young Hawaiian surfer who faced a super bug and uh, faced a below the knee amputation and um and even lost uh, a lung and he is here inspiring us all he is desperately wanting to get back to his surfboard and you will be amazed but now we are here to bring you the lovely and the wonderful and the very uber talented lindsay clark Lindsay is a passionate mom. She is a devoted wife. She is a master pastry chef who <laughs> bar, makes the absolute best cakes. She does so a lot for my kids' birthdays. My kids are her biggest fans. I am too. And she is a very proud AA member who has been in recovery for over 11 years. And we are so proud of her. And she's here to open up on her conversation about her recovery from her alcohol addiction. And we very humbly welcome you to the show today. Lindsay, welcome. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so honored that you've accepted our invitation. It's really nice. This is actually my first show, uh, doing so live without my co-host, uh, Megan, and doing so solo. And um, I'm really um, excited to have the opportunity to do this with you, to kickstart this new path ahead. We will be inviting some guest hosts as we move forward, but today it's you and I, and I'm really, really excited for this opportunity, Lindsay. So thank you. Thanks for having me. This is really exciting for me too. Uh, okay, can you, can you take us back? So take us back to your previous life, almost before alcohol, before any addiction set in. Tell me about that Lindsay beforehand. What were you going through? What were you experiencing? Who was that Lindsay? Like when I was little, you mean? Like yeah, in your childhood. I had a really happy childhood, actually. I had a really normal childhood. There was no alcoholism or drinking in my family. Everything was um, very normal. And I grew up at, out in Coquitlam. And uh, the only... The only thing that I knew from a very early age was that I was different, that I, I, I felt, I felt like I didn't fit in. I felt like something was missing. Mm -hmm. um, so it, you know, that didn't come, I didn't come to realize that was kind of a, a thing that a lot of alcoholics feel mm -hmm. um, when they were growing up, they just can't pinpoint what it is, but they always feel like um, a bit of a black sheep or, you know, wow. just, just something's not quite right. And wow. 
Yeah, and so I, I never really figured that out until I went into AA and they were, people were speaking of their experiences and, and growing up and that's how they felt. I was like, wow, so that all makes sense now. Wow. Um, yeah. How did that play out when you felt like you were kind of the black sheep or didn't really fit in? How, how would you have experienced that? Um, I don't know. I always felt like I was in trouble. I felt like, mm. um, I don't know. I, I didn't grow up particularly religious and, and I always felt like, uh, maybe God was punishing me or, you know, it was very, it's very lonely at times to grow up that way. And, and although I was, I seemed to be a very happy kid on the outside and, um, on the inside, it was very difficult. Wow. A lot of years. Yeah. yeah. And so when did you turn to alcohol? I started drinking when I was 13. I just tried it because that my friends tried it. And um, pretty much from the very first drink, it felt good to drink. It yeah. felt it filled the void. It made me feel more normal. It helped me socialize better. Um, so it was kind of an instant gratification the very first time. So it was never this slow well, it was kind of a slow progression because you can only drink so much when you're that age, but it was definitely a, you know, I had found something that made me feel whole right? yeah. from the very first time. It's really interesting that you're, you're, you're going on this thread because um, as you know, I'm interviewing Dr. Gabor Mate next and he has a really phenomenal quote that I was going to have him open up on and I'm just going to read it here. It's impossible to understand addiction without asking what relief the addict finds or hopes to find in the drug or in the addictive behavior, mm -hmm. right? Because it's like filling that void, right? Yeah. And that's so interesting that you're just putting that all together from your own patient experience or your own experience, right? Mm -hmm. And so at 13, while that's so young, but you felt this, you felt that this um, brought you to a different level of happiness, joy. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then how did you, how did it progress? Um, I think it the, the same way it kind of does in, in high school, kids party, they binge drink on the weekend. It was kind of the the same as all my friends. The only thing that was different was I always just kind of took it to the next level. So, you know, they would finish drinking and go home and I always wanted to stay or I'd go home and have another. Mm -hmm. or it just kind of always went that little bit above everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, that really definitely took off in high school and and um, yeah it got kind of, it, it ebbs and flows. Like some years was really bad. And then I went to BCIT to study um, architectural tech, like to be an architectural technologist. And um, I kind of tabled it a little bit because I really had to focus on school because I really wanted to succeed. And then it kind of, yeah, after school, I just kind of started partying again. And it, and it, it just climbed worse and worse every time became very um, all consuming, I guess you could say. And did it even, were you drinking during the days as well? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah at the very end, especially, um, like at the end, I, I got sober when I was 30. So um, yeah, at the end when all of your friends kind of taper off from partying hard, I was more found myself drinking alone because um, there was no one else they wanted to drink like I did. And then it became where you're ashamed to be drinking so much because you know, it's kind of other people don't do that. So yeah, I would drink in the morning sometimes if I was really hungover, drink during the day just to get me through the day. Um, yeah, it got really, really like all day by the very end. And how were you feeling? You talked about that feeling of shame, right? How else were you feeling in this time? I think I felt trapped mm -hmm. and um you're in this you're almost like a prisoner in your own body really because at that point when it had gotten so bad and you know I became very good at hiding it because I didn't want anybody it, it's a complicated situation because you don't want anybody to know that you're drinking because you don't want them to take it away but in a sense I couldn't stop on my own so I wanted them to know so mm -hmm. you know that over the years people had spoke to me about um about my drinking and that they think I'm drinking too much and that sort of thing. And yeah, it never really, I was just kind of brushed it off because I, I guess I wasn't ready. I don't know. 
Um, took a long time before I was ready. And then when I was ready, I couldn't ask for help. Um, that became really, the, the challenging part was wanting help, but not really being able to ask for it also. So not able to ask for it, or did you not have the resources available? Um, the support in place, like. Yeah, I definitely had a lot of support. I had a lot of good friends and um, I even, so with before my husband, I was with someone for three years and I finally worked up the courage to ask him for help, that I needed help. Oh. I, had, I had realized that I had a really bad problem and I wanted help and I, I said, I think I need to get some help. And he's like, you don't need help. You just need to stop drinking. And he okay. just kind of brushed it away and that was like, okay, so my one yeah. cry for help is completely brushed off and, so and denied. Just, mm -hmm. So it just carried on like, and became even more fearful to ask for help along the way. So um, my now husband actually was the one who sat me down and s said, like, do you think you have a problem? And, and that was the biggest relief, I think, of my whole life. <laughs> Wow, it was like the words you were waiting to hear. Yeah, I just and wanted no. someone to notice so badly and someone to help me. But, you know, I also was hiding it a lot and no one knew how bad it had gotten, um, except for him because we were together all the time. Okay, so this started at the age of 13. Mm -hmm. Now, how old were you when you met your husband? I was 27. Okay, and yeah. so still, still drinking. I'm guessing you're able to function really well. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> and um, what was your general health like at that point? It's so funny to look back at photos of myself in, in those late stages because I just, my whole face looks so puffy. Wow. And my eyes are not fully open and, and I just look sick. You know, I, I, looking at photos sometimes is, is hard because you're like, wow, that is not... A healthy looking like I think other people that may look at the photo think that it looks normal but you know you know how you should look and, mm -hmm. and I didn't mm -hmm. yeah well and I I saw you up there in the in the snowshoe trails a few weeks ago <laughs> you are one healthy vibrant mama up there so that was really good to see you there but so tell me so your husband says you need help what are the first few steps like what are the tools you must have had to dig so down deep to really pull out these these strengths to really stay the course when you've committed to doing this. So what what were those tools that you used to get onto your recovery? Um, I think I learned early on that that vocalizing that I need help and reaching out for help was, you know, the support is there and and that um, you know I, I always felt that I wasn't meant to live that way. Hmm. And so, so like the, incongruent. you were living on almost like this incongruent life from what you yeah. want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it kind of just came to a head where I just didn't want, this is not the life I'd planned out. This is not what my parents planned out for me. And they were one of the, they were the first people I called with Gavin to say that, you know, Gavin had asked me if I had a problem and, and I needed help. And they were of course like 100% behind me. And so I think it was, um, I don't know specifically what the, the tool was. It was more, it was like taking the help, I think. Just being yeah. vulnerable, learning how to be vulnerable. And that when people offer help, they mean it. Yeah. You know, they're, they're not doing it just to make themselves feel better. It's because they love you. Yeah. And I, I felt very empty and unloved for a very long time, even though I was. So, and then power of that vulnerability it's just immeasurable right when you can really drop that guard and i've experienced this on my own journey right and just say look i need help like i need supports in place for me it was help with my family right and mm -hmm. but when you drop that guard it is um just such an experience if you let it happen to be loved right mm -hmm. and be consumed by this by this force of love. And I think that alone is so healing that so few of us are really able to get to that point of being vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. It's so, so true. So important on our journey to be really real about the hardships. And that's exactly why we're here doing this show is to really be real about how hard these struggles are, mm -hmm. right? And it's so important because so many people, like you were saying, even in childhood, but I bet 
like, you know, compounded by the shame during, during your alcohol struggles and feeling that isolation, right? It's just compounded. And so many people are experiencing that. And I know myself, even though I was enveloped with forces of love from all corners of our great world, I hosted 60 hospital guests every day, but I still felt so alone. Oddly enough, unless I was really connecting with those who really understood my journey in the hard, in hardship and how hard it really was. And so that place of vulnerability, is so powerful. And only when we allow ourselves the ability to really express these negative emotions and feel them, right? Because we're all like, it's a societal pressure to be positive, right? And we yeah. all want to be, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. This is great. But there's almost like the difference between what's called unrealistic optimism versus realistic optimism, right? And unrealistic optimism is that approach where I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. But I don't like, no matter what happens, I'm going to be fine. Realistic optimism is more like, I'm going to be fine because I have a role to play here. And I believe in my own ability to do that, right? And Mm -hmm. um, that realistic optimism is what we all need to implement those tools and have our proactive uh, role and our accountability in our struggles. And um, I'm really um, I, I just am so uh, honored that you're here sharing this story. And I'm just, I, you are just a hero. Um, so please tell us, as you're going through your recovery, what were those hard times when you were like, shoot, I can't, I can't do this. Like, I really need to go back to alcohol. And how did you, how did you find that strength, Lindsay, to not do so? You've been in recovery for 11 years. It's phenomenal. <laughs> I am so sure there have been moments on your journey, right, that have been tempting and maybe not. I don't know. But please tell me, like, how have you found the strength? Um, well, it's been such, there's been so many different stages in my recovery that different things have worked during different times. And I th- to be honest, I've never really wanted to drink that much okay. because other than at the very beginning. So obviously the first year was very challenging, but I wanted it so badly and I wanted out so badly that, you know, that, that will, yes. you know, I, I held on to that so much. I just, I, I wanted to, one of the things I heard in, in um, early sobriety is that like everyone that goes, there's no bad people. It's just good people that do bad things or just like, bad, bad choices. And, and, you know, I always thought like, what's wrong with me and I'm a bad person and all of this. And that was one of the most powerful things that I heard was, you know, that we're all just good people in a really bad place. And, and I, I think believing that you know, in AA, they have let us love you until you can love yourself because you come in very, at a, obviously at a bottom, at a very low point. And, Broken, yeah. Yeah, and being accepting of that love and letting them love me and carry me through those first, you know, it was, it made it so much easier. Um, I really just wanted to be better, to be my true self. And, and I knew I was better than how I felt about myself. And did you like, did you have a visual visualization of what you would see on the other side? Was that a strong force for you or was it just this will and connecting with that feeling of what you really wanted? Yeah, I think it was more um, what I wanted to be, what I knew I was capable of. You know, I, I grew up with very supportive parents, very supportive mom and dad who always encouraged me and supported me. And, you know, you could do anything that you want if you put your mind to it kind of mentality. And Beautiful. And that really helped me. It helped propel my sobriety, knowing that I was capable if I just, you know, worked hard at it. And and you have to, there are difficult things. You have to take the support. You have to put in the work in AA. You have to ask for help, which are all really difficult things for people to do. Even today, I still have a hard time asking for help. And when I'm at my low points is when I do things that, you know, I, I would never normally do before, like, post on Facebook like I had a really really bad day today and I'm really not doing well and then there's just this as you mentioned before there's just outpouring of support from people like I feel the same way I know exactly what you're going through whether or not they suffer from alcohol addiction or not it doesn't really you know everyone's got their stuff at the end of the day whatever we're going through right hurt is hurt pain is pain grief Mm -hmm. is grief and that like 
fundamentally connects us all, no matter what the story behind it is. So, yeah, that's really that's so powerful, right? That, again, that power of being vulnerable and putting it out there and having the courage to do so. I just mm-hmm. really admire that, Lindsay. So that's amazing. I find the human connection is so powerful. You know, yeah. when you ask for help and you can connect with people. Yes. That is so healing. And yeah, it does it does wonders for the heart. You know? Have you found it harder now with COVID without that connection right there? Yes. Yeah, I, fi- I found COVID challenging for a number of reasons because it's, you know, everyone's cooped at home. There's all these alcohol jokes and everyone's like, it's very much at the forefront, you know, right. that, that people are at home drinking because there's nothing else to do. So this has been a challenging year, but, you know, luckily I, I have a good support system in place. That's great. Um, you know, even though there's no in-person meetings, there are AA, like Zoom calls. Great. So can, which is great because a lot of the people that I used to see in meetings that, you know, moved away to California or wherever, you know, you log in and you see their face and, and you just feel instantly connected again. Oh, that's beautiful. We have a question coming in um, on the live. And um, how about we read this out, Lindsay? Uh, this is from Rachel Catherine Benjamin. My cousin is an addict and has a phenomenal opportunity to go into rehab, but he's not sure he can do six months. How would you encourage and not push? Great question. That is a very good question. Um, I think my my advice is to not look so much at the number of months, Mm -hmm. not try and push that it is this big, long gap in time that um, you have to, a little bit of willingness and you have to just try a little bit. So, you know, don't push that. I don't know. So it's so complicated when people are resistant um, because you have to really want it for yourself. And, and a lot of the times you can, you can say, I will support you or whatever you decide. I will always love you, you know, and make it a place from love and not like you have to do this. It has to be six months. It has to be this and that. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause people get really scared. Like I used to go to, to meetings and people would take a one month chip you know, and you're like, oh my God, how am I going to, you know, how am I going to do that? That's, mm-hmm. that's not like, or even one year, like it, it's just such a hard concept to wrap your hand, your head around time. Mm-hmm. So trying not to make it about the time. I think, you know, they say one day at a time, that's our biggest thing. And mm-hmm. they, is it is, it is, it's just one day. Mm-hmm. If you can make it one day, then that's enough. So Yeah. I would suggest you, um, you know, connecting with that, with that feeling as Lindsay was talking about earlier, right? Like, um, so that he can connect with that feeling of what he really wants for himself and that change from where he's at, where he wants to go. Um, Yeah, all amazing tools, Lindsay. And so how, um, how is your life different now? Oh, I don't even... Oh, every day is so full of gratitude. It's like, oh, amazing. You know, it's an amazing. It's an amazing. Sobriety is such an amazing thing. It's like the you think about like I have these children and this life, and it's light years different than what I was before. And I go to bed every night, and I have gratitude every single night. I put the- my head on my pillow, and I just say thank you. Ah, you know, it's really beautiful. Yeah. And you're an active mama, you're a devoted wife, and you're this mastery pastry chef, which we'll get into in a second. But we have another question here from Rachel as well. Great question. How do you seek out others who are going through what you are going through on Facebook groups or do you have any other suggestions? Um, the question would be if you are, is this the same one before? She yeah, said? Rachel. Okay. Uh-huh. So there is um, a group called Al-Anon that is for family, for oh. people, like with people of addic- addiction. So like if you are the wife or the brother or whoever, um, that is a support group for the family. So and they that's can- Al-Anon, like anybody can find that online? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's it's the same as AA, online. it's the same as Narcotics Anonymous, Every, there's all groups. And Al-Anon is just specifically for families that need support. 
Okay, and that's amazing. Yeah, again, it's leaning on, on, you know, the the human connection. Some going through what you're going through, um, and you will find someone who has your exact same story and who will be able to guide you. Really powerful. Tell me what about rehab. Did you actually go to rehab? I did. Yeah. I did. Can you tell me about that experience? Yeah, that was. Wow, that was interesting. It, I um, I went for six weeks. I went on the island, and I. It's funny, I just drank up until the very last second that I went in. Wow. You know, that's where it, my, my head was. In. So call up, I guess. Hmm. This panic of like, I'm never going to be able to do this again. You know, and wrapped up in that, like I was speaking about before, about time. You know, like how long am I, is it going to be until I have a drink again? And that was my main, that's why I was such a prisoner, is you're constantly thinking about that stuff. And yeah, the first few days were really rough. Um, I had the... The shakes. I'm not sure if you've heard the DTs. That's like delirium tremens. Tremens. So that's like, um, like you hallucinate basically because you're detoxing so bad. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a lot of that, and um, they do a health check, and I was nearly like in liver failure. It was just so, I was so so sick. And once you get, once I got over that, um, it was actually somewhat. I wouldn't say easy, but I wanted to be there so bad and I wanted to get better so bad and I had wanted it for so long. That, You're so determined. Yeah, that I just, I wanted to do the work and I wanted to be there. And um, my family came to visit me. My sister and Gavin came every single week to the island on the wow. ferry to come see me. Um, it was it was a beautiful experience really for me personally. Um, yeah, I'm so lucky that I got to go. I'm so grateful that I got to go. You get so many tools and it just sell, sets you on such a good path. And did you meet people there that were good supports for you as well, who were also yeah. going through rehab at the same time? Yeah. I yeah there was a few of us that now. really connected. Uh, um, and I still keep in touch. Like we're still friends on Facebook. And yeah, it's nice to see. There, there's some people that, you know, you lose touch with and you always wonder what happened, but you, you hope that they're on the right path. That's powerful, though. Mm -hmm. Connection again. Yeah. And so, what would be your biggest takeaway for some of our listeners as to maybe they're a loved one of someone really struggling and wants to get unstuck? What is our next best first step? I think just asking for help. Yeah. You know, it's 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 hard to pinpoint exactly what's going to work for some people or not. Um, yeah, for me, it was, it's just being vulnerable and, and ask and take the help, I think would be more of it. Maybe it's not asking for help, but taking the help. Mm -hmm. If someone says something to you, you, you take the help mm -hmm. and, um, you know, where you're not a bad person. You're not, you know, no one's punishing you. It's just, it's just part of part of this horrible disease you know you just it's it's very complicated spot to be in and and anybody that I can help if anybody wants to reach out you're welcome to to reach out and ask me more questions well, beautiful. Um, how would they find you Lindsay um you can find me you can find me on Facebook or you can go to my um Instagram I'm also on Instagram um at Lindsay ask. Clark yeah okay. or no it's um Doodles Clark and Co <laughs> Doodles, Clark, and Co. Okay. If anyone's friends. interested, you can just reach out to me directly, and yeah. I can point you in the right direction. That's, That's a complicated great. name. My, one of my best friend calls me Doodles. So yes, I see that. <laughs> I see that note there, Rachel. Taking the help seems to be the hardest thing. You have to let go part of yourself, hands down. Yeah. I do not agree more. And yeah. I've been experienced this with something totally unrelated to alcohol addiction, right? With having, I was always this like super fit, this poster child for health and wellness. Like I had it all together. I was a sports chiropractor, super active mama, like, and asking for help and breaking down that guard, it, it is the hardest step. You yeah. are so right. But at the same time, it's also the most powerful step. Mm -hmm. Reach out, Rachel. I'm happy to help support and, um, and, and, and help you get to that raw point of vulnerability for, um, for those around you, for yourself. So don't hesitate to reach out. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Lindsay has transformed herself. She's an entrepreneur. Uh, she is a master 
pastry chef. <laughs> the best cakes possible. So if you are in the Vancouver Lower Mainland area where we are here in beautiful British Columbia, Canada, you be sure to reach out to the uber talented Lynn Clark because she is just, she is such a gift on my path. And you should see the smiles that my boys have every time they see her beautiful cakes. So I love to cook. I love to like to cook in the kitchen for hours on end. But baking is just not my strong suit. I have been <laughs> over, over and over again. But when I cook, I don't really follow recipes, right? And yeah. um, I just kind of throw it all in. Any healthy bits I can throw, I just add it all in. But with baking, you can't just do that. You really need to follow the recipe. I've learned really mm -hmm. the when a cake comes out of the oven, it just doesn't look like a cake. So, and fun. <laughs> is a type one diabetic. So we have a lot of, you know, cautions with that with cake. And Lindsay has really um, helped us navigate around that beautifully. And um, yeah, just a phenomenal contact on our path. So if you are looking for a cake, reach out. She is the master <laughs> chef. Lindsay, this has been really great. Are there any notes you would like to leave us off with? I don't think so. I, I'm just so, I'm so grateful that you asked me to do this. And, you know, several years ago, I probably would have said no. Um, I wasn't as open to sharing about it all. But the more you share, the more people you connect with. And that's really what powers me through all of this is, you know, the human connection and you know what if someone asks for help and I help them and they don't take it that's you know that's fine it's I learn I grow from it and maybe one day they'll eventually think of that and, and get help but yeah so Lindsay did the hard work she um went through the entire process and look at her she was just out in these snowshoe trails she is mm -hmm. a passionate mama she is this amazing entrepreneur. Lindsay, you have my whole heart. I am so honored by you and by your courage to share your story. You've inspired so many people already. I will maybe connect you with Rachel um, directly after this and anyone else. And anyone else. I think this is really um, amazing of you to offer that connection. Again, that, that piece, that human connection, right? Mm -hmm. How so thank you. So glad you asked. <laughs> Okay, everyone. So um, thank you for joining us with this show, opening up on recovery, alcohol, and addiction. And um, um, really looking forward to seeing you all on the live for our recording with Dr. Gabor Mate. And then up at 2 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, we will have Carter Perry, the Hawaiian young surfer. You will be inspired by all three interviews today. I guarantee it. Life-changing information here. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Rise today, risers. We can't wait to see you back again. All the best. That was good.